Okay, Yang, now that we talked about SN2 substitution by molecular, now I want to talk about something called E2, elimination by molecular. And I think I kind of missed out on this on the last video, but by molecular I told you uh, the concentrations of both kind of your reactants can affect the reaction rate. That would be your substrate and then your nucleophile, right? Okay, for SN2. Okay, so let me give you an example of E2, and then we can kind of see what the differences between E2 and SN2 are because they are competing reactions. Okay, so let me give you something like this. If you have your common naming hat on and you look at this, you'd say, oh, that's a little bit of a T-butyl chloride, right? Okay, so if we took T-butyl chloride and then let's say I threw in some OH- and let's say I used acetone as my solvent. So remember, this polar aprotic solvent is going to allow my hydroxide to kind of do its thing, but it's not going to crowd him, right? Okay, so here's what happens. Could this be an SN2 reaction? And the answer is a hard no. Because remember, we first look for what kind of substrate we have as far as degree, right? And if we look at this carbon that's attached to the leaving group, because you always look at the carbon directly attached to your leaving group, we're one, two, three. We're a tertiary substrate, right? Sterically, that is awful. That is so bad. When you have a tertiary substrate, you have zero SN2 reaction occur, okay? When you're primary methyl, SN2 dominates. However, when you have a tertiary uh, substrate like this that's very sterically encumbered, then you have something called elimination occur instead, all right? So now look, we have a, I have a symmetrical uh, structure right here, right? doesn't matter if I interact with any of these three methyl groups, and that's important, because here's what happens instead of substitution. I'm going to draw on all these hydrogens right here off this methyl group. So what's going to happen is my hydroxide, while it is a good nucleophile, aka it likes those partially positive atom, atoms to attack, remember hydroxide is still a base, right? And a nucleophile in the sense that it likes H+. So here's what's going to happen in this E2 mechanism. I'm going to have my hydroxide grab H+, off of a neighboring carbon straight straight neighboring carbon from my substrate carbon. I'm then going to take these electrons that were in this bond from the, eight, from the proton I'm grabbing and I'm going to swing them down like this. I'm going to form a double bond between a carbon, a neighboring carbon, and my substrate carbon. At the same, this is all happening at the same time. While that is occurring, right, I'm going to break the octet rule unless I do something. Because remember, this carbon is bonded to one, two, three, four things. If I'm going to add a double bond here, that would be five. I need to, I need to break a bond. Well, luckily, we established that we need to look for good leaving groups, and Cl minus, if we kicked off this chlorine, would be a good leaving group by itself. So let's kick him off. Okay, so just to recap, because we have three arrows going on, OH minus is taking two electrons and is going to grab this H plus. Just the H+, plus, no electrons coming along with it. The electrons that were in this bond between this carbon and hydrogen are going to make a double bond right here. While that double bond is forming, to avoid breaking the octet rule, we're kicking off a good leaving group. So here's kind of the result. We make isobutylene. You don't have to worry about that common name. That just is a common name. And... We also make Cl minus, and if you want to kind of list everything, we technically make water. But I'm really focused on this product. Whenever you have an elimination reaction, here's kind of what that means. You're eliminating a bond right here. You're eliminating H plus. You're taking these electrons and forming a double bond here and eliminating your leaving group. So you see how that kind of makes sense? And when I say simultaneously, in SN2 and this reaction here, this is what's called a concerted mechanism. Concerted means it happens in one step, it all happens, bam, at the same time. Okay? So, now that I've kind of introduced you to what elimination is, you always end up with an alkene, you always make a double bond. I'm going to erase this. I want to go over some finer details of E2, kind of the conditions you look for, like how we did that for SN2. A little quirks, and then we'll be done with E2, and we'll move on. But, 
Let's go over those details. Now that we saw an example, I want to kind of go over our little E2 checklist and then do another example and then kind of go into one specific aspect of E2 that we need to cover. Okay, so things you need to look for here. You need a strong base. The size, whether it's big or small, that's what we're going to talk about in a little bit. But you need a very strong base, right? Because remember, you're grabbing that proton the first step. We need something that's really, you know, trying to look to do an acid-base reaction. You need a sterically cumbersome substrate, okay? So for E2, tertiary substrates, that's like dead giveaway you're doing an E2 reaction. If you have a strong base and a tertiary substrate, dead giveaway. If you have a strong base and you're secondary, and pretty good bet you're doing E2. You can make it work with a primary substrate, but you need a really big bulky base, and we'll cover that in a little bit. Okay, erase that. So, and this is the case for every reaction we're talking about. If we're kicking something off, it has to be a good leaving group. A good, stable conjugate base, aka a weak conjugate base. Remember, it has to be stable, otherwise nature it will not be about that. And to make sure we're not, you know, dragging our bases down, we want a polar aprotic solvent for the same reasons we did for SN2, okay? All right, so let's go over another elimination reaction, but I kind of want to dive into what I mean by a small or big base. So let's look at something like this. Let's just say I threw in some hydroxide here. Okay? And actually, we're going to do two, kind of two different reactions. But let's handle this top one first. So let's look at our first, let's look, always look at our substrate first. Oh, let's just say we do this in acetone. Actually, you know what? Let's switch it up. Let's say we do this in DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, but we know that is a polar aprotic solvent. So, Hydroxide, we know, is a pretty good base. We know it's a good nucleophile, but definitely also a, a no slouch in the base department. So let's look at our substrate. We know we are a tertiary substrate, and we do have a good leaving group in chlorine. Okay? So in the first reaction I did with T-butyl chloride, we were symmetrical, but now we're no longer symmetrical, right? So, right, we know we're tertiary, we have a polar aprotic solvent, we have a good base, this is all pointing towards an E2 reaction, but the question is, when I go to take off an, a hydrogen, do I take off a hydrogen from this neighboring carbon or this neighboring carbon, right? Which one do I do? And do, these are symmetrical, right? So I could pick either one for these two. But which one do I take? Here's kind of the rule of thumb. If you have a really small base, then you go to the position where you make what's called the more substituted double bond. And here's what I mean by that. The two double bonds we can make are is one right here, and, we'll use a different color, one right here. So by more substituted, here's what I mean. So you can see between the green, we have a tertiary carbon, and we would be double bonded to a primary carbon, right? But in the blue bond, we'd have a tertiary carbon double bonded to a secondary carbon. More substituted means that both of your carbons kind of have the highest degrees, right? So tertiary primary versus tertiary secondary, the blue bond is more substituted, the green bond is less substituted, okay? So if your base is small and you kind of have to choose, do I make you know, the less substituted bond or the more substituted bond, small base means more substituted double bond. So I'm going to pick off this hydrogen right here. So let's draw the arrows. I'll do this in red. So I'm going to take two electrons from hydroxide, grab this hydrogen. These electrons are going to swing towards our substrate carbon to form a double bond. This is all happening in one step, remember. While that's occurring, I can erase that hydrogen. While this is occurring, chlorine is going to leave and packs his stuff while grabbing those two electrons for the road. Okay. So here's kind of the result of that electron flow. We didn't touch anything over here, right, because we made the more substituted double bond. I now have a double bond going this way, as well as the methyl group over here. Now here's kind of the difference. If you're thinking there saying, okay, so when do we make the less substituted double bond? Good question. 
So let's say we have the exact same reaction conditions. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to redraw this. Only the best for my geochem people. Right? Let's say we have the exact same reaction with DMSO, but now I'm going to introduce to you guys two new bases. One base called LDA, which looks like this. And another base that looks like this. So this base is called lithium diisopropyl amine. So you can see there's two isopropyl groups. And if I draw the spectator eye on, it's a lithium. And this one is called potassium tert-butoxide. So if I draw in the, the potassium spectator ion, potassium tert-butoxide, or T-butoxide, or LDA, lithium diisopropyl amine. You can see that these are clearly much bulkier, much bigger bases than, say, hydroxide, right? So I would call these big, bulky bases. And here's the difference. Let's say we were going to use some LDA in this reaction. So instead of being able to get to this position right here to pick off this proton to make a more substituted double bond, what actually is going to happen is this. You always look for the least sterically encumbering proton to take off. Because these bases are big. This base is small. It's easier for them to pick off a primary proton than for them to kind of get in here and get a secondary proton. So if you have a big bulky base, you make the least substituted double bond. And if you have a small base, you make the most, the more substituted double bond. So here's how these arrows would flow. Let me kind of draw some LDA for us. Draw it sideways. We use red again. Right, we pick off the proton. Once we've done that, we're picking up H+. These electrons stay to swing down and form a double bond. Once that double bond is starting to form, we need to avoid breaking the octet rule by kicking off chlorine. So the net reaction looks like this. And we'll have Cl- at the end. And you don't have to worry about redrawing your base. He's kind of served his purpose. Okay. So hopefully that made sense, okay? So if you have a smaller base like hydroxide, or on my worksheet I know I used NH2-, which is a very strong, small base. If you see either of these two, you're going to make that more substituted double bond. If you see these two, potassium terbutoxide or LDA, those are going to be your least substituted double bonds because they're too big to get to the more substituted uh, position. Okay. I need to touch on one more thing before we wrap up E2. Just stick with me, and then I promise SN1 and E1, they will be simpler because we've already talked about SN2 and E2. Okay, gang, give me a little bit more focus, a little bit more energy, and then we'll close the book on E2. All right, so if you can see these two reactions, let's focus on the top one first, and let's prove to ourselves that we're dealing with an E2 reaction here. So let's look at our substrate. We can see this carbon is attached to a Br, which is a good leaving group. So we have a good leaving group. And it looks like this carbon right here is secondary, which doesn't really ensure that we're dealing with an, e, an elimination, an E2 reaction. But once we see that secondary carbon, that secondary substrate, we can see we're dealing with NH2-, which is a vicious base, right? Loves ripping off protons. So you can bet that this is going to be an E2 reaction also, you can see we have DMF, dimethylformamide, which is polar aprotic, which is charged species friendly, but won't kind of crowd around him and prevent him from doing his job. This is definitely an E2 reaction. Okay, so why am I kind of showing you guys this? Well, here's something we need to go over, and it's called a condition you need to fulfill called anti-periplanar. Okay. So, if you can see between these two reactions, I'm going to tell you that the elimination product you will get, because we expect the most substituted double bond, right? The more substituted double bond in both of these scenarios, because we have a small base, right? And we can either make a secondary tertiary double bond or a secondary secondary double bond, right? This would be tertiary secondary, secondary secondary. But here's what you're going to see in these two reactions. I guarantee 
you will have this product and in the bottom you will have this product and there's a reason for that also side note I made the CH3 planer because remember if you were SP2 hybridized like that carbon is then everything's flat there's no kind of wedges or dashes anymore but here's the reason why if I fill in actually I'm use blue if I fill in my hydrogens here and I fill in my hydrogen here Can you guys see that this bromine is going to be sticking up and this hydrogen will be sticking down? Kind of like this. Right? Because he's below the ring, this bromine is above the ring. Now, can you also see if I were to kind of extract these two like I did, or down here like I did up here, this hydrogen is above the ring, this bromine is above the ring. So we kind of look like this. Okay? Same side of the ring, different sides of the ring. Okay? Here's the difference. Remember when we did Newman projections and we said that if you had a group going straight up and a group going straight down, we called that anti, an anti-relationship? Well, you kind of need this anti-relationship when you do elimination between your leaving group and the hydrogen you're picking off because, and I'll, I'll tell you why, because it helps set up the pi bond more effectively. Can you see that if I, let's just say, I have NH2, grab this hydrogen, and then I swing these electrons there, and this bromine leaves, you can pretty much see that the p orbitals, I have electrons coming from below, and electrons coming from above, so the p orbitals and the pi bond are set up to perfectly kind of take over. On the other hand, right, I have electrons coming down and electrons coming up. This hydrogen is above, it's not kind of below. So your p orbitals are not going to kind of set up effectively. So what I'm trying to say is you need, a, you need an anti-periplanar relationship between your leaving group and your hydrogen that you're eliminating.